Uh, welcome back to our weekly Bible studies. This is the second one now in this uh, uh, new year. Doris, welcome. Lovely to see you. All right. Uh, and of course, Bertie. I'm presuming Sheila and uh, Sikinder can hear us. Uh, last time we mentioned that we will now continue with uh, our weekly studies. And uh, this year we are hoping that we can be a little bit more um, uh, variety oriented. Uh, we can get multiple speakers. I'm hoping our speaking team will, I'm, I'm giving them assignments in terms of at least one Bible study <laughs> in the year. Uh, of course, you're welcome for to some more. And that way I can also, we can also do some learning and training on, on the job. Uh, from time to time, we will take up, uh, you know, standalone subjects where we can discuss that thoroughly. We do want to finish our We Believe series. We are in section 13 now, and there are a few more sections to go. And there was one section I think we left out, which we will come back to. Hopefully this year we can complete that. As always, uh, we have some excellent uh, video resources and uh, I will be bringing that uh, so that we can you know, hear world-class theologians as well as uh, being able to discuss uh, that. Today, we are going to do section 13, that is uh, the subject on sin. But before we get into that, let me request Praveen to open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, with the attitude of gratitude, we bow our heads in your presence, O Lord, especially for bringing us uh, together again and giving us another opportunity in our lives where we can study your word and uh, to learn about you. And especially, Lord, this time we have decided to study about uh, the topic of sin. I pray your grace may be granted to us as Pastor Dan is teaching us, Lord, we want to hear your voice through him. And open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to understand the subject better. And uh, uh, it may reflect in our lives through which, Lord, we may be able to experience you more intimately as never before. Through everything we study, Lord, we want to find your revelation. We want to know you more and we want to experience you more intimately, O oh God. The hour we spend in your presence and in the discussion, we submit to thy throne of grace. We ask for your leading and guidance. Everything we speak, everything we do, may bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes, as uh, <clears throat> we normally do, uh, I'm going to uh, read through uh, question number one today, and I'm presuming that uh, we won't be able to go beyond that because I do want to make some comments, uh, especially with the fact that, you know, uh, in, our, in our Reformation, we began to see this particular subject in a slightly more uh, broader way. I think, in my in my opinion, we had uh, uh, narrowed, or rather, we we defined sin very narrowly, and so I want to expand it a bit, and I want you to, you know, come with uh, some comments. I'm sure you uh, might have some questions. We will deal with those also. So, uh, if uh, Praveen, would you like to put that on the screen? Yes, we are going to read. Uh, on the screen, we have the first question that is, what is sin? That's the most fundamental and basic question we must ask as we discuss the subject. Let me read the answer and then we will get into uh, some study. It says, sin is the state of alienation from God uh, of all humanity and consists of anything that is contrary to God's will, including acts of wrongdoing, neglect to do good and unbelief in the God of grace and love uh, and love as made known in Jesus Christ. At its root, sin is distrust or unbelief in the goodness and faithfulness of God and his word. It indicates a broken relationship with God and issues in lives, uh, uh, in lives that misrepresent God and his good purposes for human beings. Sin is refusal in whole or in part 
to live in dependence upon God for our meaning, significance, identity, purpose, and destiny. It is a refusal to worship God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to be his faithful representative or witness in all we do, think and say towards all. In sin, we put our ultimate trust in idols, in that which is not God. Okay, so uh, that's quite a broad, <laughs> you know, uh, perspective that we read. Uh, but let me now pick up one or two things. And first and foremost, I want to address two uh, misnomers or two misunderstandings or, you know, that we probably have had in the past. Or maybe I should say two perspectives, which was very narrowly, uh, you know, give us a very narrow perspective of sin. The two uh, misnomers that we had about sin is thinking that sin is only an act. All right. Uh, that seemed to be something that many people think uh, with regards to sin, that it's only an act. All right, so that is one thing, and I will go back to it uh, in, in more detail. A second uh, sort of narrow definition of sin, and I suppose we were probably a little bit more into this, we define sin only as the transgression of the law, All right? Uh, transgression of the law uh, seemed to be something that we used to talk quite a lot about. So let's uh, unpack that a little bit more. Let me go to that first point. Sin for a lot of people is only an act. For example, uh, if we are you know, involved in theft, the act of theft is a sin. The act of murder is a sin. Uh, well, the act of sexual misconduct is a sin. So that is how some people tend to think that, you know, sin, you know, to be defined as. But uh, we need to understand that the act is preceded by something else, right? The act is preceded by uh, a belief system. I would like to call it a state of mind, right? Uh, and what is the state of mind? The state of mind that uh, sinfulness can be defined as is uh, a refusal to trust God. Uh, so it is a way of thinking where we tend to uh, sort of mistrust God. We don't depend on God. It's an attitude of mind, right? I feel that has to be very clearly established. And I uh, feel that the Bible establishes that quite, quite, uh, you know, quite categorically. I said earlier that the act follows the thinking process. You know, the, the thinking process comes first before the act of sin is manifested. In other words, and here is an important point which I want to make. We can be sinful even without the act. Would you agree? <laughs> we can be sinful even if we don't manifest the act. If we don't, if we are not sexually, you know, you know, promiscuous or uh, we're not going around, uh, you know, murdering people, uh, we can still be sinful. And that is, I think, what I wanted to establish with regards to this. So sin is uh, much more than the act. For example, now, uh, you know, I'll just read uh, a number of verses. Let me just open Matthew chapter uh, 5. We all know on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ uh, very clearly established certain, you know, aspects of, uh, you know, sinfulness. In Matthew 5, verse 27, I'm taking one example. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. 
Verse 28, but I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay? He has already committed adultery. In other words, even before the act, the person is a sinner. Right? Why? Because of a state of mind. Because of a, a particular attitude of the heart uh, that established the fact that the person is a sinner. So uh, the root of the behavior, the root of whatever behavior we do uh, is what is important. It could be unbelief in God. It could be distrust in God. And that itself is an attitude of sin. Right. So, uh, so that is something very important for us to keep in mind. Uh, Notice it says in our answer, sin is the state of alienation, right? So this state of mind, which is alienation, uh, you know, or rather this, this uh, distrust in God results in alienation, right? It results in isolation or estrangement or distance, right? Uh, uh, it is what we would call darkness. That sense of alienation, that sense of isolation is uh, perhaps the biblical term which can use, which Jesus uses, is darkness. I want to go to John chapter, um, I think it's John chapter 3. And notice in verse 19, all of, all of us know John 3.16, but let me drop down to verse 19. Uh, here Jesus says, this is the judgment. That light has come into the world and the people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Verse 21, for anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Okay, uh, so notice, loved darkness, it says, uh, people loved darkness rather than the light. So that darkness, that, that is the alienation, the distance, the, the uh, you know, you could say separation in one sense from God that we want to have uh, is the darkness that unfortunately lots of people, you know, want to live in. Why? Because it also says, People love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil, right? Uh, the deeds are the result of darkness. So the deeds were indicating that they were in darkness. So once again, the darkness is primary and the deeds are the result of remaining in a sense of darkness. So that is uh, what I would want to, uh, uh, you know, expound. And then, of course, it also says uh, people sort of loved darkness and remain in darkness. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately, it is the choice that they make, right? It's a refusal to change. They change a state of mind and they want to remain in that sense of alienation. All right. So, uh, this, I believe, I think I have mentioned this before, is the ultimate denial of reality. You know, as they live in darkness, they think they are living in light, but they are miserable. They are constantly in a state of, you know, uh, misery and suffering because, and they think that that is what they want. That, I believe, is the ultimate denial of reality. And I think that is. Uh, uh, that is the real state of sinfulness. That is this kind of sin that, you know, results in all of these acts that we talked about. So I, I hope I have established that. Once again, if you should have any questions, we can discuss that. Remember, sin is an, uh, a state of mind, not just an act. Yes, it is an act too. The act is sinful deeds, right? And let's let's not forget that we can be a sinner even if we don't commit the act. Let me go to the second point now. 
And this perhaps is something closer to home <laughs> because uh, this is how we have tended to remain uh, in our definition of sin in our pre-Reformation days. And that is, we believe that sin is the transgression of the law, all right? Now that is correct, but uh, uh, there is much more to sin than just the transgression of the law. You see, because we focused and we emphasized the law so much that the law became very important for us. And I am not faulting that. The law became very, now uh, we won't get into what the law is. <laughs> Under the new covenant, we describe the law in a different way. We, we'll keep that for another time. But whatever you understand the law to be, that became so important for us that we were many times accused of being legalistic, right? And I heard someone describe legalism uh, in Hindi. And I really liked that, uh, uh, the way it was expressed. In Hindi, legalism is expressed as lakir ka fakir. Lakir ka fakir. They cannot go beyond that line. That line is very important for them, right? Uh, <laughs> so I thought that <laughs> that was very well expressed. Uh, but let me, let me go back now to this uh, transgression of the law. Now we get that from 1 John chapter 3. Uh, uh, let me just go back to my Bible here. Okay, uh, uh, let me read through from uh, the epistle of John, 1 John chapter 3. And in verse 4, it says, Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. In the old King James Version, it is, uh, you know, transgression of the law, right? And it goes on to say sin is lawlessness, or rather it goes on, yeah, that is what in, in the King James it says. Sin is the transgression of the law. In the New International Version, it has it as sin is lawlessness. Now, I think there are some interesting points we need to pick up from there, right? Uh, so in another translation, it says, everyone who sins breaks the law. I think it, this is an NASB. New American, uh, different ways of putting it. But I think if we look at the various translations, we find something interesting there. Everyone who sins breaks the law or everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. Notice it doesn't say uh, uh, it doesn't say everyone who breaks the law is a sinner. Notice the difference. It says everyone who sins breaks the law. It doesn't say everyone who breaks the law sins. Did you see the difference? In other words, because of our sinfulness, the act of breaking the law, the manifestation of that sin is breaking the law, right? But that is a very important distinction we need to keep uh, in mind. Uh, so here is the important point. Sin comes before breaking the law. It is because of an attitude of sin or a, or a state of sinfulness that we break the law. We don't become sinners just because we break the law. We are sinners even before breaking the law. I hope you get the distinction there, right? Because of a state of sin, uh, we then proceed to break the law. Now in the uh, Greek, uh, the word used is uh, uh, anomia, which means lawlessness. Basically, un, uh, help, it helps us to understand it living. It is living with our own standards, uh, right? It, it is helping us to. Uh, it is. It, it is showing us that 
we do not subscribe to anything ultimate. Uh, in other words, I decide what is right and what is wrong. That might give you a clue as to what I'm discussing. You remember the, the original sin in the Garden of Eden. Do not take off the tree uh, you know, of good and evil. We have understood over the many uh, you know, discussions we've had and the study we have done that mankind chose to distrust God and decide for himself what is right and wrong. They decided not to depend on God to define what is right and wrong. So that is the ultimate sinfulness. In other words, saying, God, I don't need you in my life. I don't want you to tell me how I must live my life. I want to be my own boss. I don't want you, God, to be my boss, the boss of my life. And that, I'm sure you'll understand, is what we call postmodern thinking. Everybody defines what is right and wrong according to their own standards. The postmodern thinking is uh, there is nothing like right and wrong anymore. There is nothing like ultimate right and wrong. Right is right for somebody who defines it in, in his own particular way. And wrong is obviously done, you know, according to their own standard. So what is the problem there? The problem ultimately is rejecting God as the ultimate reality and as the ultimate authority. That is the darkness that people want to stay in. Uh, as Jesus said, they loved darkness. They want to be their own boss. They don't want to submit to the authority and the sovereignty of God. So uh, transgressing the law or, you know, transgressing the law is a manifestation of sin. It is not primarily sin. It is the manifestation of sin. It is, sin comes before the breaking of the law. Now, uh, I'll just very briefly, I think it is good for us to mention this. You've all heard of the doctrine of original sin. And this is something that uh, we have, uh, I mean, the Christian world, uh, is, it's a very important doctrine for, for us who are in the Christian faith. That we believe that the doctrine of original sin means that human beings are born in a state of sin. Right? Uh, they are not necessarily born neutral, like some people would like to say. Uh, they are born in a state of sin. Okay? Uh, I want to read a few scriptures here. Just allow me to uh, just turn to a few scriptures. And it's important that we do that. In Romans chapter 5, I think this is one uh, very, uh, you know, very clear scripture that helps us to understand this doctrine of the original sin. Romans chapter 5, reading in verse 12. Uh, it says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sin. This to me explains that uh, the doctrine of original sin is something that is biblical. And it is important for us to recognize that it is, we are all born in a state of sin. And that is the problem that has to be finally corrected. It is not just breaking the law. It is not just, you know, ab abstaining from an act of sin. It is a state of mind that has to be cleaned up, cleansed, redeemed. And that's the reason why Jesus says repent. What is repent? It is the changing your way of thinking. Changing and accepting, you know, your, your way of thinking and accepting the reality, the ultimate reality that Jesus Christ is, you know, the Redeemer, the Savior. And, and so the concept of original sin is something very, very important. So that tells us that we are, why we break the law, why we commit acts of sin, because there is a natural inclination for human beings to go in that particular direction. You could say there's a predisposition. I mean, this is 
talking about those, we talk about predisposition for someone, let's say, who's a drug addict or an alcoholic. He's predisposed to alcoholism. And so in that respect, you have to be very careful. I'm presuming that today, this day and age, people do DNA studies and you can actually find out your predisposition to some diseases. I'm told that you can actually, you know, through a DNA analysis, find out whether you are going to be predisposed to diabetes, uh, you know, uh, uh, blood pressure and all that. And if you manipulate the gene, <laughs> apparently you can cure it. I'm not sure uh, if that is true, but uh, this is what uh, I have been hearing. Okay, now uh, I, I explained to you the concept or the uh, doctrine of original sin. Now, there are some people who tend to say that Jesus never taught original sin. And they may go to a scripture in the book of John. You remember the man born blind and the question that was asked by the, uh, the religious teachers. What did they ask? Who sinned? And you remember what Jesus said? No one sinned, neither this man nor his parents. And some people tend to take that as, oh, that means to say there is nothing like original sin. Jesus uh, did not teach original sin. But uh, I, I, I think I beg to differ on that. And uh, let me just read you just a few scriptures there. Uh, and I'll go first to Luke chapter 13. Luke, in Luke 13 and verse 3, or maybe I'll begin in verse 1. At that time, this is Luke 13, verse 1. At that time, some people came and reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifice. This is uh, when these Galileans were performing, you know, offering sacrifices. They were massacred and their blood was spilt on the sacrifice. Verse 2, it says, and he responded to them, do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? And then he gives the answer in verse 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. In other words, Jesus here is saying, we are all sinners. Everyone needs repentance. So how can, uh, you know, um, that's basically affirming the fact that we are all born into sin and there is everyone who needs, you know, a repentance. In John 3 and verse 18, uh, John 3 verse 18, it says, anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. Notice once again, what Jesus is saying, if anyone who does not believe is already condemned, in other words, uh, in my understanding, he is affirming the fact that we are born with uh, condemnation. That is the reason why we have, we are all subject to death. Death is the penalty or the result of sin. Right? One more scripture, and this, this time I'm going to go to the book of Acts, uh, teaching of the apostles here. Acts verse, uh, uh, chapter 17, verse 29. Uh, the apostles also I believe, taught the concept of original sin. Uh, it says in Acts 17 and verse 29, since then, we are God's offsprings. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone and imagined fashioned by human art or an imagination. Um, see, am I reading correctly? Yes, it goes on to say then, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people Everywhere to repent. Why would the apostles say that? Because uh, everyone is in a state of condemnation, in a sinful state. And there is a need for repentance for everyone. That is the change of mind and accept the new reality, which, of course, is Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. Otherwise, we stand condemned. So I believe the concept of original sin uh, is very much part of the scriptures. So uh, we are proving the point that 
sin is uh, not just the transgression of the law. It is much more than transgression of the law. In fact, we transgress the law because we are sinners. And now let me just explain to you or show to you that sin is more than just breaking the law. You are a sinner even if you keep the law as perfectly as you can. Why do I say that? Well, let me once again do a few more scriptures and then we'll stop uh, and get into our discussion. James chapter 4, what does he say? Familiar verse, I'm sure, for many of us. James chapter 4 and verse 17. Uh, it is a, here, here is a, a, one more definition of sin. It says, so it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. James is saying that sin is not just keeping the law perfectly. Sin is also when you know what is right. What, and, and the context there is actually, uh, you know, uh, the way you treat others. Uh, and, and so uh, if sin is not doing what is right, when you can do right, when it is in your power to do right, that is classified as sin according to the uh, according to James Romans chapter 14 Romans chapter 14 let me just uh, uh, okay and in reading in verse uh, 23 here it says but whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And now notice how the author describes sin. Everything that is not from faith is sin. So sin is much more than transgressing the law. He is expanding the whole uh, you know, definition and the perspective of sin. Okay. I will look at one more verse and then uh, we can get into a discussion. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews uh, chapter 3 and verse 12. Okay. Uh, here it says, watch out brothers and sisters so that there won't be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Okay. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Okay. So basically here he's saying that you are uh, termed evil, right? Uh, if you turn away from the living God. So in other words, here is many more ways that we can understand what sin is. And in closing, let me just mention, all of us know the, uh, the parable of uh, the uh, talents. And you remember how Jesus described that last servant, the third servant, who was given a talent. And what did he do? Uh, he went and buried it because he said, you're a hard task master, right? You reap where you don't sow. And so he accused the master. And of course, how the, was the, what was the response of the master? That, uh, you know, you have done that which is wrong. I mean, if you think, uh, uh, you know, uh, in other words, the attitude that he had towards the master was a sinful attitude. Describing the master as evil. And that is the denial of ultimate reality. The master is supposed to be good. By denying him that goodness, he is falling into a sinful state of mind. I wanted to bring those thoughts because... Some of us may uh, continue to have had some, uh, you know, perspectives, especially from our previous teachings and also some teachings uh, in, in currently where sin, uh, you know, is very described very narrowly. I felt that we needed to expand that just a little bit more. So let me just finally uh, go back to the answer that we read from our booklet. Sin is the state of alienation, right? From God of all humanity, right? Now it consists, it includes rather, uh, here it is, it includes 
acts of wrongdoing, neglect to do good, and unbelief in the God of grace, right? Notice, it is first and foremost a state of alienation. It's an attitude or state of mind, right? Where we have rejected God and it manifests itself in wrongdoing, neglect to do good, unbelief in the God of grace and love made known in Jesus Christ, right? And one more thought, sinful, uh, sin is refusal in whole or in part to live in dependence upon God for our meaning, significance, identity, purpose, and destiny. And I feel that this begins to expand the whole perspective and concept of sin. Okay, I'm going to stop there and uh, let's open it up for any thoughts that uh, struck you. Uh, maybe you, 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 you probably understood sin from what we had taught in the past. Maybe you can mention how maybe some of, some of these things perhaps has given you an added dimension, an extra dimension. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to bring it up. <clears throat> yes, Anil, go ahead. I think what struck me most, uh, as you just explained, is that, of course, uh, uh, sin is breaking of the law. But we are sinful. That's why we break the law. I think that is very, very profound. I, one, one doesn't think that way. One thinks, oh, when we break the law, we sin. But we are sinful. That is why we break the law. That is really something that really came out in this. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Even that was uh, uh, and a revelation for me because... <laughs> You know, we focus so much on the law that uh, ev everything was connected to the law, but we didn't realize <laughs> we we come to the law with a sinful attitude. Right. Good. Okay. Looks like Uncle Sam, Zach. Had... Go ahead. Yeah, I had two points to make. One was uh, one is quite easy and maybe both are controversial. I don't know. But uh, uh, the first point I would like to make is usually children are innocent. They know no sin is what the world says. Yeah. Right. And uh, to support that particular one, Christians also use this particular uh, verse where it says, uh, you know, that uh, Matthew 19, 14, let the little ones come to me for, you know, uh, because like them, you know, the kingdom of God will be like them. They use that particular verse and they say children are innocent, devoid of sin. And whereas we know that mankind, the, the entire reason for the Lord coming back was that, you know, to make our path straight and to have, you know, that uh, to pull us out of that sinful nature and get us to that nature to be uh, as one as you know um, a godly nature which is triune which is that that you know that communion that we see in the trinity so I wanted to point out that that you know when people whenever they many of them make the children are devoid of sin they do not have sin in them no we have it in them it's just that we though that things kick out later on you know more because initially and the uh, and also the reason why the lord says i think uh, the lord says in the verse about you know the kingdom of god is like them is because they're trusting you know because they're loyal those things but not the innocent wala part <laughs> as of now they may innocent no no some of the children don't have to be taught some of the wrong things they just pick up right so this is one point i'd like to make and of course anybody else has for this particular point you can uh, add to this or uh, we can um, you know have a discussion on that the second thing i wanted to pick up was uh, many of the verses that i um, even before the uh, the uh, what do you call it the discussion started today uh, for me the the, the point that was highlighted was, uh, you know, every time when we say sin, we look at sin as like this big, big thing, you know, big things, you know, like uh, uh, lying is sin. We'll keep lie also, no problem, because it's also part of the Ten Commandments, commandments mein aa gaya. you know, adultery is sin, uh, thieving is sin, coveting is sin, jealousy, all of these things we will take. But one thing that we sometimes do not re realize and recognize is that 
neglecting to do good that was the first thing that that uh, when i read through the portion that hit me was knowing and you picked up the same verses of you know james 4:17 when you, when it says therefore to him who knows if you know knows to do right and yet doesn't do so there are people who do not know whether it is good or right so that is understandable but if you know that something is good and we still do not do it that is sin then uh, the in hebrews 13:6 you know it says yeah. do not neglect to do good 13:16 sorry hebrews 13:16 also it says uh, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to god so many places you see this you know neglecting our the things that we are called out to do you know many of them know things that are not right but yet because you know sometimes as christians we like to play diplomatically kisi se nahi konga lene ka kuch galat idhar idhar bhi nahi bolne ka udhar bhi nahi bolne ka beech mein rehne ka of course we have to weigh our words our words have to be seasoned with salt all that is there but we have to do what is right and so i just wanted to bring out that and tell you that that particular um, thing pointed out to me apart from what all you mentioned so yes okay I appreciate your thoughts uh, shanti but uh, uh, so uh, but yes uh, the point about children is interesting i have heard that uh, argument being made that children are innocent uh, and so they don't fall under the original sin I, the way i would like to see it is they are innocent no doubt but they are that they are not sinless and you very rightly put it shanti that that it is not fully developed in them and as they go on to live their lives it begins to manifest itself in so many ways very early actually <laughs> uh even uh, i am amazed what kindergarten children can say you know the kind of swear words they can use <laughs> it's amazing how you know the things that they're capable of but yes that's a, that that was a good point Yes sir. Yes Franklin go ahead. So can so can you hear me? Yes please go ahead. Sir is it correct to say that man is a born sinner? Yes. Sir one major religion says there is no such thing as sin. And Christianity is, is it correct to say that man is a according to Christianity man is a born sinner? Uh I, the way i put it is that we are born in a state of sin right the potential of doing lots of things that are wrong or sinful acts is so much very much in us so that is how we believe human beings are born right so did you understand franklin or uh, you uh, i remember one writer i don't know who's that in sin did my mother conceive me david david yes yes i mean uh, yeah that, that is used also to uh, sort of prove the original sin thing uh, but uh, you know there are better scriptures that we can use to prove that point but uh, did you have a, a question franklin or, or was just just a statement uh, yes sir. okay sir. okay okay sir i have one more question sir okay a more important question okay the the term original sin does it refer to man or does it refer to satan because the bible says it is satan who fell uh i would say both it's inclusive <laughs> yeah it refers to man in this in the in the fact that we are born in this uh, sinful condition a fallen condition but the original fall we know goes back uh to lucifer right so there is an inclusiveness there so original sin started with satan sir original sin started with satan i if you that that would be a correct statement by saying that okay thank you sir yeah reka you had a thought No, I was just thinking about James that uh, we are all passive. We know things and we just don't do it. We have to be more active, and that is the part I was thinking. And then God has given us a choice. 
go, go this way or that. And we must make the right choice by believing in God. That is the main thing. Uh, yes, doing good. Uh, and I think Jesus talks quite a bit about that. Uh, in the, you know, in the, in Matthew 25, he talks about how he honors those who do even the least, you know, to the least of these people. And so he very much is uh, conscious of the fact that we need to live a life where we are constantly giving and exercising love. Love is, you know, uh, other centered. We are constantly uh, aware of other people's situations, distresses, needs. And I think uh, what you're saying is right. Uh, there is, uh, we need to live with that manifestation of love, but many, <laughs> many times we only manifest sin. And that is the unfortunate thing. Okay, Praveen, you have any thoughts to add? Maybe Pr Franklin, we'll finish with Franklin and Praveen can come in. Franklin, go ahead. The man who was born blind, no, sir. The man who was born blind, Jesus said, uh, he did not sin. Then how do you explain that particular text? How do you explain? Well, Jesus himself explained it. Good. Now, it is not easy to understand what Jesus said. He said it is to glorify God. <laughs> uh, see, how I like to look at it is, not all suffering is the result of sin. Okay? We may suffer even by not sinning. We might suffer by somebody else's sin, right? Uh, but when Jesus says it's to glorify God, maybe what I understand is that God is not limited, that even in our finitude, even in our suffering, he can bring good out of it. And that is a glorification of God. That is how God's power and sovereignty is. That even though we are broken, he is able to bring good out of it. You know, that's what a Romans 8.28 says, doesn't it? It says, uh, uh, in all things, God works for the good. So God being glorified is basically the power that he has to be able to bring good in spite of the fact that everything is broken. That's how I look at it. Is that okay, Franklin? Yes. Yes. All right. Praveen, go ahead. Uh, I guess uh, we have a couple of uh, questions left. Actually, once you discuss about it, uh, uh, many uh, many of the points, if you, I mean, most of the points, even if I'd like to mention, may be covered as you're uh, dealing with the next uh, other questions. And uh, But one particular point is, uh, I believe in uh, original sin, but it may be, lit it is little sli slightly different from what we have discussed now. Uh, so maybe when I get time, I will uh, share my thoughts on this, since it's okay. all 656. Uh, we'll... Yes, okay, that, that's fine. Uh, yes, obviously, you know, I mean, uh, sometimes this whole concept of original sin, it's, 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 it's not an easy concept to fully recognize and, uh, you know, Absolutely. and we come across against a lot of people who don't believe in it. Uh, uh, what I say is when we deal with this subject also, we should be Trinitarian in our perspective, yeah. number one. And number two is uh, uh, the doctrine of sin makes a huge difference or it is so very important because of the other doctrine, that is doctrine of salvation. Uh, because uh, our salvation is basically from sin because of the results of the sins and various things are there. So we need to connect both and look at it uh, uh, through the cons Trinitarian concepts of atonement presented in the Bible, especially by Apostle Paul in Book of Romans, as uh, which uh, you have taken and rightly pointed to us, uh, especially from Romans chapter 5 and uh, even from Hebrews. We need to take uh, these concepts of atonement seriously and uh, we need to look at sin also uh, from Trinitarian perspective through these concepts, which makes the doctrine of original sin different because uh, we cannot simply judge, uh, you know, judge, uh, uh, you know, the, it, uh, by saying a doctrine. Like uh, Franklin rightly I presented the question, you usually how people tend to feel. Can we say everybody born sinner? So that question is different, and uh, being born with sin is definitely different, as you mentioned. So. Our concept, 
especially our understanding in a Trinidadian perspective through the uh, uh, through uh, the atonement theories which are presented in Bible makes much difference and clarifies those questions. Okay, so we'll uh, wait for uh, you know maybe an exp exposition on that. Okay, uh, as we go through. Yes, Surimurti, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. I just want to say a few sentences. And what I am going to say applies only to me. <laughs> it is not for others. <laughs> <laughs> See, there are a lot, a lot of books on, a lot of law books on sin. I am just exaggerating. And I have abolished all those law books in my life. God says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, whatever it is I have. I might not be quoting properly. And love your neighbor as yourself. So instead of trying to define, understand, do all these things as to what is in, you simply begin to apply these laws in your life. It automatically uh, it, it lightens your life. It, it, see, there was a time in the train where they used to write less luggage, more more comfort, travel pleasantly. So, by reading all these books on the sin, we are only burdening ourselves. Jesus' statement is very simple. You love your God with all your heart, love your neighbor with all your whatever it is, I, I may not be quoting properly, that case of, takes care of everything. Well, that is, that is. Okay. Uh, I appreciate what you're saying, but I wish life was as simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> no, in personal life, in personal life, it is, it is not a question of going to teach Bible to others. I want to live the way God wants me to live. So the yeah. simple formula is that you apply this law. Love your God always to the fullest extent. I will love your neighbor to the fullest extent. If you are going to, you, if you commit any mistake, you tell God, yes, God, I have committed a mistake. Don't use the word sin. Sin turns the people away. Of course, sin, the word is there in the Bible. It is used frequently. But when I make a mistake, mistake it certainly brings everything to the mind. Right. God brings everything to the mind that it is sin. But why to use the word always sin, 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 and punish ourselves for that? <laughs> so you make a mistake and tell God you have made a mistake. You made a serious mistake, you tell God it is very serious. Please forgive me. <laughs> that is this this concept applies only to me. Uh, I am not suggesting. Okay. But... <laughs> right. Yeah. Anil, you had a thought? Uh, I thought you were. <laughs> No, I agree with what Suryamurthy is saying, but it's the application of that law, love it with all your soul, no, heart. I tell you. That is where now, the problem comes in. Now and, that we have now that we have studied the Bible almost for 30, 40 years, everything we do, something we do wrong, it immediately brings to our mind that you are doing something wrong against what is stated in the Bible. Yes. So that takes care of that. Good. All right. Uh, very good discussion. Unfortunately, time has gone by. Uh, uh, you know, we are discussing sin only because it's in the Bible. And unfortunately, for you, Surya Burti, we are still going to discuss sin. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and you, <laughs> discuss, see, you may discuss it. I, I'm reading the same Bible which you're reading. So sin, I have to read. But okay. when it comes to the personal application, Good. we're to yeah. burden ourselves always saying sin, sin, sin. It's simply, yes. Jesus says very simple terms. You love God with all your heart. You love your neighbor with all your uh, mind, whatever it okay. is. Yeah. All right. I think Bertie wants to say something. Bertie, go ahead and state. Yeah. And can then we also close in prayer. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, yeah, what Surimati brought out is very, very important, but let's not forget 
that uh, Christ has changed us um, and from inside out, and he has transformed us mm -hmm. and uh, to bear his image and likeness. So my point is, let's not leave Christ out of it, because we are overcomers through Christ. See, I, I, see, I am not living. I am not leaving Christ alone because I say you love God with all your heart. Yeah, you love God with all your heart. That includes Christ. Okay, yeah, well taken. I know, but uh, even uh, that uh, that enablement, empowerment, and that uh, inspiration comes from Christ Himself because we are in Christ. Never, uh, Surimoti, that could help you and me and others. I am not refusing it, buddy. Yeah. I think when we will stop it there because, yeah. you know, uh, we, we can keep going on uh, and trying to explain. But I think let's stop there for the for, for today and we can come back and discuss some more. Bertie, could you please lead us in a closing prayer? Yeah. For myself? Yes. Yeah. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just want to thank you uh, for this uh, Bible study time. Thank you for inspiring your servant, uh, Mr. Zechariah, Lord. Thank you for uh, 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 using him as, as a, uh, an instrument, a Lord, to build us up in Christ. We're thankful for the subject of sin, which uh, we have seen in a broader sense. And Lord, we know, Lord, you have addressed the, uh, uh, addressed this uh, virus we could say and uh, lord you have put things right uh, and we receive you as uh, as a life we're grateful lord for this teaching we're grateful that uh, you are blessing us with understanding and wisdom that comes from from god uh, we have the help of christ we have the help of his spirit your word lord and we can enable lord you help us to love you with all our heart mind strength and soul and love uh, others our neighbor equal to self or as jesus said love uh, love your neighbor as i have loved you Lord, you enable us, continue to, and bless us as we, you have called us with a holy calling, Lord, in Christ, and you have made things right for us, Lord. Help us to be uh, instrumental, Lord, in our own lives, to live and share the good news, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for blessing your people. Thank you for Mr. Zachariah and family and all the other participants, Lord, and their families, and bless those who could not, Lord, uh, participate in this Bible study. Thank you so much, Lord, for... Uh, having patience with us and working with our lives. We, Lord, we want to declare your wondrous work. We want to have con uh, considered the, and have regard for the working of your, of your working of the operation of your hands. Thank you, Father, in each of your, your working in each of our lives. Thank you for this time that we could come together. Bless your people. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray this in the blessed and glorious name of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.